And I'd like to welcome everybody who's here with us live and everybody who's also joining us via the recording. It's wonderful to have you here from all around the world for Episode 7 of Awakening Beyond Thought, an online interactive journey out of the blah, blah, blah of everyday life and into the simple strength of stillness. We have our hosts again, Gary Weber and Rich Doyle. We're grateful for them to take the time to do this with us in this monthly fashion that we've been we've been keeping with, and we're excited to have all of you here as well. So I'm going to give a brief introduction to them both, and they will start uh, with an introduction themselves, and then we'll jump into questions. So Rich Doyle, a.k.a. Mobius, is a liberal arts research professor at Penn State University, where he has taught since 1994. Uh, he is an author of several books. One of his most recent is Darwin's Pharmacy, Sex, Plants, and the Evolution of the Newosphere. He was also the host of our Radio Free Vallis course, and that was an amazing uh, collaboration with Penn State as well. So we're grateful to have him back uh, doing this with his co-host, Gary Weber, who has over 30,000 hours of meditation and yoga experience with various teachers in various disciplines and countries. Uh, he's worked in many different areas, including military, national labs, industry, and academia in R&D and management. He's also written several books, including Happiness Beyond Thought, A Practical Guide to Awakening. And we're just so glad to have Gary here. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of this, uh, as people were logging in, the feedback so far for these shows has been amazing, people finding it very healing, myself included. So we'll just keep with what's been uh, just working so well, and that's you guys asking lots of questions. For now, I'll turn it over to Rich and Gary so they can introduce tonight's session. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, just something to uh, mention, which is that uh, Gary and I are putting together, uh, along with um, Non-Duality Press, a uh, UK publisher, The Finishing Touches, on a book of dialogues just called Into the Stillness, uh, Dialogues on Awakening Beyond Thought that are based on a lot of the videos that we did together. So uh, that ought to be out in the next month or so, uh, maybe a little less, and looks beautiful. And it's really been a, process, a wonderful process, even of just working through the text. So I think it'll be useful to, for people uh, in the same way that these dialogues uh, seem to be proving useful to people, because dialogue itself really is uh, the method that we're uh, offering here. Um, as always, basically, we're just here ready, willing, and empty for questions that people uh, have. And so if they have them, they should bubble forth. Great. So I can start with one right away, you guys, if that's Great. unless, Gary, you wanted to add something. Um, okay. Uh, Matthew asks, I was wondering if Gary and Rich could talk about could talk some about using the when am I inquiry question. Every time I experiment experiment with it, it seems very mental. It requires a line of reasoning, quote, am I the same, I, from a few minutes ago, et cetera, et cetera. I have a lot of trouble getting a feel for this inquiry question. Thanks. Yeah, Matthew, the, the, uh, the power behind the when am I thing uh, isn't to go into the intellectual thing as you, as you discovered. The idea is to just see as you go through any given day and go through your different relationships and meetings and tasks of the day and just feel if the Matthew that shows up is the same one every time. I mean, get, a, get a feel for Matthew when you're talking to your best friend and what that subject feels like. Then watch yourself as you go through the rest of your day and see if that same feeling of Matthew is there with every individual contact you have in the course of the day. It's really about getting a sense for what Matthew feels like and does Matthew change that feeling in the course of as he changes his day. Because that idea is looking, the fundamental question is, is there one Matthew? Or are there many Matthews? Is there a whole horde of Matthews, thousands of Matthews? Virginia Woolf said, you know, you have as many eyes as you have personalities and relationships. And you find that if you watch yourself in a relationship, don't believe Virginia Woolf, do it for yourself. See if, in fact, there are different Matthews or if they're exactly the same one each time. Yeah, and, it, and you know, sometimes uh, if a question is not working for us, you know, if, it, if our cognitive mind is really good at trying to turn it into an idea, 
rather than a perceptual event, as Gary is pointing to, that you're really actually looking for when am I, at what moment in time is this so-called I occurring? Is it happening when I'm interacting with Jennifer? Is it happening when I'm interacting with Gary? Um, if our mind is getting in behind that and creating a lot of uh, kind of, uh, you know, chatter, then probably it's a sign to shift it. And you move to, you know, where am I or who am I or who's having this issue with when am I? Um, any sense of question that directs your awareness, all we're trying to do is take our awareness and bend it back and look and from where it is coming. And if we look at from whence it is coming, we look for that I and what we find instead is awareness. And the experience of that awareness then over time dwindles that sense that there's an eye there figuring out when it is or where it is and so forth. Yeah, as Rich points out, uh, the eye is a fiendishly clever opponent, and it will do whatever it can to uh, block, derail, confront, slow down this incursion into its space. It doesn't like this investigation. It will do whatever it has to try to block it up somehow. You may find that a question works for a while, you begin moving your way in, and you find the question to become dull. It's been stopped. It doesn't work anymore. It has no bite to it. There's no feel for it. And as Rich says, find another question. Just be careful you don't get tricked by the eye and the window shopping around and changing your question 83 times a day. Because that's also a way to deflect this inquiry. The idea is to use the inquirer to go inside, but expect you're going to get some resistance because the eye doesn't like this. Going to find some way, whatever way it can find, to slow this process down. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. If you'd like to reply in the chat, please feel free to do so. I have David uh, kind of following up. I have a similar question about where am I? Is this to expand my where to the full perception of senses? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's, it's really just to, again, uh, uncover the fact that the eye isn't any place. I mean, I've, I've given this talk several times, but we now know from cognitive neuroscience there is no little place where the eye sits. The eye is all over the brain, ad hoc, comes on the scene as waves of energy sweep across the cortex and pick up different operating centers for different ad hoc requirements. There is no place that the eye exists. It exists in a thousand places, hundreds of places at least. So we're just trying to you know, identify for ourselves, can we pinpoint it? We think it's kind of someplace like in between the focal length of the ears, the eyes, and the nose. Someplace in here is sitting in there. But if you begin watching, when you watch when you move your leg, when you touch your hands, or when you move across the room, you may find the eye someplace else. Say, where am I? If you're doing these the yoga posture flows that they're on the video, you can watch that and just see as you go through that yoga posture flow, where are you? You watch your hands touch the floor, you watch your back bend, you watch your head turn around. You see if, in fact, you are staying in the same place. Or what your where I am is, is moving around. It moves from your hands to your feet, to your knees, to your back, to your, oh, that hurts my, my shoulder. Just watch and see if you stay in the same place or if the eye moves all over the place as the situations change. And the more you look, the more, uh, you know, this sense of there being no particular location that the eye is in cre can create a very expansive sense of ubiquity, you know, that you can experience when you start to experience yourself as nowhere in particular then you'd start to experience this eye as a field rather than a point. And when you experience yourself as a field, like you're just as much that cardinal chirping out the window as you are, you know, this person on a bicycle or this person sitting on a couch. And really feeling that is the point, not really just knowing it conceptually that we're a continuity or that we form a continuum between all living beings, but really feeling that it can be sort of the carrot that you can feel on the other end of this. The incentive is that's very expansive in feeling when the brain starts to let go of this idea that the eye is in some particular place. At least that's been my experience. 
Yeah, and there's a circuit in the brain, this default mode network we've talked about many times. Lots of blog posts on it, we've talked about it in the videos. And there are one sub network of the two sub networks we've covered this before. It's worth going back over though, creates this sense of you and other things. You're here, the other things are over there. And this looks at that question Is that true? I'm here, it's over there. Or if in fact there is nobody here, there's nothing here that's a real subject. And if you get that deconvoluted enough and that circuit shuts down, then you have a common mystical experience of all is one thing. You become everything, not because you philosophized yourself into believing you're everything, but in fact, you're not any place, as Richard was saying, you're not any place in particular. You're all over the place. If you discover that, then there is this sense of everything is one thing. And you know, what's interesting is, is that uh, in the intro to uh, Gary's book on the Bhagavad Gita, um, uh, verses on a week. Yeah, somebody wrote. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the analogy that came to mind is this idea that sometimes when, um, you know, probably you're thinking about something else and you're walking upstairs or walking downstairs and your legs are absolutely certain that there's another step there and they go to find the step and it's not there. And it's, you know, it's a very funny moment. I can actually remember George Carlin doing a stand up routine uh, about this uh, in my youth. And it's the same with the sense of ubiquity. It's like you had, you were absolutely certain that the eye occupied this kind of point in space. You, you know, you never really thought to figure out where it was in space, but you, of course it is. But then it turns out it's not there. Actually, it's kind of hilarious that there is no point in space where the eye is. And as that releases, as Gary was saying, it, it seems like that circuit, which makes the distinction between over here and over there, this thing here and that thing over there, just sort of stops, you know, functioning in, in the same way. And you really do have quite a frequent experience of ubiquity that usually we only experience, you know, in sort of moments of great beauty or the sublime. You experience it quite often. And there's another way to do it, too, as Rick was talking about walking. As you walk, just see what, in fact, where you are in that process. You may find you're running a parallel universe up in your head. You're up here talking about whatever from something, some other narratives going on about your partner or something that happened during the course that is going to happen later. And yet, lo and behold, the body is walking on down the road. The body doesn't <laughs> need you to be there. The body is functioning just fine. Thank you very much. If we had to think about doing this, it wouldn't happen. So the body's going along doing this thing, and the question is really, where are you? Because you find you're up here, going back and forth, narrating and worrying and problem and shaming, yelling and holding at yourself, and you'll do better next time, just try harder. But in fact, the body's moving right along. So where are you at that moment? You're up here. You're not actually having anything to do with what's actually happening in your life. And the irony is, is that as you ask where you are and observe where you are, you see like, oh, right, I'm in my head again. It releases, you know. I can remember one particular morning in particular, I was riding my bicycle to school, and I was, as Gary was saying, I was on my bicycle, and the body was riding the bicycle. But I was up in my head saying, oh, yeah, oh, 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 I got to do this, you know, do that. And then I observed, a part of me observed that that was happening, and it just looked out of the woods that I was riding through. And those woods were so beautiful and stunning and silencing of that, you know, that you start to realize, and you start catching yourself on these things, and you start feeling the difference between the, you know, hillbilly bear up there in your head going, roll, 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 you know, and, and just going along. I don't remember that cartoon, but, and, and just going along and being. And the and the the two states are so distinct that you get better and better in in stopping with the grumbling. I like that baritone, blah blah blah. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Um, I'm gonna go on to the next question, unless unless I interrupted the answer there at the no, end. Oh, okay, we appreciate it. Thank you, David. Uh, Yes, thank you, David. Um, and this one is also along similar lines uh, from Jake. 
He asks, um, Ramana, Ramana Maharishi advocates both, one, holding on to the I thought itself, and two, on to the source of the I thought. You folks talk more about deconstructing the I. Deconstructing seems to imply more of a purely mental process, whereas holding on to the I thought invokes a very visceral sense of being for me. Can you talk about the difference between yours and Ramana's recommendations, if there is one? Also, why might Ramana be advocating two different practices, or do they simply lead to the same place? Thanks. Yes, yes, no, <laughs> yes. But, hi, Jay. Um, when when he, he said that, I mean, maybe we had this discussion before, uh, this idea that the holding on to the I am, which is Mr. Gardada's famous approach, uh, doesn't lead to the same place as Ramana Maharshi's direct inquiry, which is who am I? Who am I is, uh, for me, in my experience, it takes you a different place. Because if you're going to hold on to I am, then if you watch where that goes to, and you can even get the feel of it, you look at you know, holding on to I am, and just trying to follow that through down to the end, that doesn't totally deconstruct the doer. I mean, there's somebody doing this process of being uh, the follower of I am. And if you ask, who am I? What that does is it doesn't, yes, there's someone asking them initially, but it very quickly rolls you back into a question that goes directly back on the eye. Where am I does, when am I does, what is this doing this? Those all roll back directly in questioning the validity of the eye. In the other case, you're following this I am. There's somebody following it down to its root. In my experience, that latter one doesn't do the job that's the direct inquiry of where am I, when am I. As far as Roman doing lots of different things, I encourage anybody that's listening to this, they want to download Talks with Ramana Maharshi. It's a free PDF download, 700 pages. It captures Ramana Maharshi's ashram at the peak four and a half years in the late 30s. And people would just, he would lie on his couch, 724 basically, and people would come by and ask questions. And person A might accept one answer. Person B might need another answer. Person C might get another answer to the same question. People would ask exactly the same question. You would get three different answers based upon how ready they were to take that thing forward. So he may have said, okay, what's your best practice? You do you got your mantra. If that's good. You keep doing got your mantra. Next person, what should my practice be? You should be asking, what, who am I? And he's just finding what's necessary for that one person, the public teachers, and what level is this person? What are they capable of understanding? And what are they ready for? So you'll see lots of contradictions in talks because it's a it's a day by day repeat of the, the questions he was asked and the answers he gave, and you'll see a lot of what are for apparent contradictions, but it's really just a good teacher changing the message to suit the person. Also, I, w I wanted to address this idea that um, the deconstruction of the eye is a mental process. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I I it doesn't feel like that. Um, the deconstruction of the eye, and I think if, if you look at, you know, probably the context in which Ramana is giving these answers, it's always an attempt to, as much as possible, turn the awareness back to whence it comes. At first, just like, okay, well, who's having this awareness? I am, right? Whence comes the I? Look further back. Um, that's more of a introspective, uh, perceptual process of really looking and feeling whence comes this I. It's an observational process uh, more than a mental process. As soon as we start having ideas about the constructed nature of the I, then we're bringing the I in to have a very elaborate mental map of this now fragmented I. So I, I really, I know it might sound like it's mental, but if you think about deconstruction as a word about, you know, taking parts, you know, and pulling them, you know, into pieces and looking at the actual kind of physical construction of something, I think that's more what happens is you just start to observe that this thing that it appear was apparently one thing is really just these post-it notes of memory and fragments of feeling and different kind of senses that you're having about an idea of who you were. So I think it's really a, a deconstruction of a mental process rather than a mental process. 
But if it feels like a mental process, that probably means, pace our earlier answer to Matthew, that you probably want to shift the question a little bit and really go after a different angle on the question of who am I? Yeah, Norma Marshi's uh, Upanishad Saram, to kind of his magnum opus, at least it's channeled magnum opus, goes, Aham ayam kuto bhavati chenvita ayi patakyaham nija vicharanam. He says, you just look at where the I comes from. Aham ayam kuto bhavati. Where does this I arise? You can follow it back and just watch as you have an I manifest. Just watch where a thought comes from. Watch where the chant comes from, where it goes to. Watch where the eye arises. It's kind of like you're thinking about following it back, but you aren't following it back. You're just waiting for it to arise and just see ahamayam kuto bhavati, where that eye comes from. And that second line is that self-inquiry. That's what he defines as self-inquiry in his 30-verse magnum opus, which is a great summary document for Advaita Vedanta. It's actually taught in uh, I've had it in a lot of places like the one not too far from here as a short course, basically clip notes. You guys still do clip notes of Advaita Vedanta. Everything is in that, and this is a self-inquiry book. And this observation can take a while. You know, I mean, think about Galileo looking through a telescope, discovering the Galilean moons, and through a process of very careful day in day out looking when he could look, when it's clear, through the uh, telescope, you know, adjusting for conditions, thinking, when is this coming into being? When is this going out of being? We're doing the same kind of precise observation rather than thinking about, he's not just thinking about these moons, he's looking for them, observation of whence the eye comes into being. And when we do that, you know, the results are no less profound than, you know, Galileo's, frankly. That, that's a good metaphor, too, I mean, because it really is being curious about, not being intellectual, just being curious about how many moons are there. Yeah. I mean, just what? why are there, why are there two or three moons? Are there really three moons or two moons or five moons? How many moons are there? The same thing with the eye. Where does this come from? And you watch very carefully, just like you're exploring something under a microscope. You just watch very carefully and say, where does this eye come from? It's there, it appears to manifest. I, the, the questions we're looking at is when am I, where am I, who am I, are just trying to get at the nature, understanding about these Galilean moons, and say, okay, what's the deal with these moons? What's the deal with the eye? That was, to me, the big revelation in Calvary Madame Harshi's work, is he said, forget the objects. You will never disentangle the objects. There's too many of them, they keep changing. Just go back and look at the subject. Just go back and try to understand the subject. So all these things that, that may seem contradictory or paradoxical, we're just trying to, different pointers of ways to look at the eye to try to understand it. And understand if this unquestioned belief we have is it's one entity, it's running a place, and we have to have it around. Is, that, is any of that true? You begin looking, then it becomes a really like a scientific exploration of how many moons there are. Just walk very carefully. What is this thing? With a lot of curiosity, and see if in fact it's real. And one more analogy is, you know, bird watching. You know, you think about how careful, and the people travel all over the world, and careful with the best binoculars, and they learn how to be still. They want to see this bird. They, you know, they get in the right position, or if they want to learn what song, where is that song coming from? Which bird is singing that song? You have to look. You have to be careful. And observe, and it's that curiosity, it's that desire to know which bird is singing that song that really is a solution. That's not really a mental process in the usual sense. Mm, great, great metaphor there. And uh, Jake says, thank you. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Jake. Thank you for the question, Jake. Um, great. Uh, well, I have more questions here, so I'm just going to keep going. Uh, Omar asks, um, do you guys find that the questions change, evolve from who am I, et cetera, to much richer questions, almost like organic personal koans, kind of like in the Zen tradition, except they're your own articulations? Yeah. <laughs> All right, next question. <laughs> Hi, Omar. Uh, I, I, I never liked who am I. I know it was Roma's uh, 
the name of his first book that he wrote. He actually wrote that book in the sand, in his fingers in the sand, so he wasn't talking at the time. But um, who am I? You can get philosophically branched off into all kinds of philosophical discussions about who am I, which is why for me, where am I, uh, who hears, were much less equivocal. There are more direct pointers to a physical question like how many moons are there? I mean, it was that kind of a question. So, uh, you know, something I could focus on empirically and try to understand it without getting into a philosophical, philosophical construction about it. So to me, I, I looked for questions like that. Be careful as you get too creative with the question because they can get very long and very complicated. Your love will get pulled off into the intellect and you'll be doing some really uh, unnecessary work. If you can keep them as short as possible, as pointed, but you can make them ad hoc. You can make them, who is it that fell off the bicycle? Yeah. Who is it that has a, has a broken leg? Uh, who is it that's angry right now? You can do that. Or what is it that's angry? Or what is it, where is this thing that's angry? What is it that has this broken ankle? Just You can do that on ad hoc basis. Just be careful. Don't make it very, very long so it gets too entangled, too many layers of, it, of uh, consideration to come to a conclusion. Make it simple, direct, and personal if it really grabs you personally. Yes, you can make it very rich and very strong if you just grab the moment and say, who's, who's angry right now? Uh, Omar just uh, asked in the chat, where is awareness? Yeah, exactly. That's, is, where is it, Omar? <laughs> no, that's, that's a beautiful one. Yeah. Uh, and, you, and it is interesting that it happens very intuitively. Um, when I was teaching my Bible as literature class, it, it occurred to me that the very first commandment is, in fact, you know, useful as a self-inquiry question. You know, am I loving God with all of my heart? Right. Is a way of pointing my awareness back to see who would be doing that. <laughs> right. So uh, as you, you know, work, go through your day and as you work through the questions that you're working through. It's very true that spontaneously different kinds of questions you can feel when, when you're BSing yourself too, you can feel when you want the question to be really special and creative and, and, you know, more complicated than Ramana's or something. And you can also feel where it has something specific to do with your own itinerary that is, that is being worked through there. I personally uh, always have uh, um, gone back to where am I? As a uh, as a question, uh, just seems to really cut through absolutely anything. And again, it's only patient exploration and experimentation of different questions without sort of just as Gary says, window shopping, without just jumping from one to the other, that allows you to find that like ah, okay, that one tastes good. That that feels right. I feel that. That's my my mind can't get behind that one immediately. It it doesn't know where awareness is. So where is awareness? Cool. Yeah, and the whole thing about you know, to, to don't get addicted because Maharaj's book was Who Am I? You have to use that and just doggedly sit there for 25 years asking yourself, Who am I? I mean, if you really get engaged in the process, you really are looking for the moons. Then you have to find other questions because it doesn't. That's not enough to get you into the answers. So, absolutely, improvise. Find very strong personal things that mean something to you. Uh, as I say, find something that's less equivocal. Like Bruce says, my default was always where am I as well. Uh, just come back to it. It's a real ground that you can't find a quick answer to. Whereas, who am I to get philosophical about? Experience. And where everything is somewhere, <laughs> you know. Right. So if you're saying where, you know, and you can't find it, pretty suggestive. I hope that helps, Omar. <laughs> uh, Omar says thanks, thanks guys, and uh, you, yeah, thank you for the question, Omar. Uh, I'm going to keep rolling forward here. Um, I'm going to ask a question from Ivan. And I'm going to um, probably need help pronouncing something, so I'll just get to it when I get to it. Um, my question is, there is confusion about the paths to awakening. I find myself, I find myself drawn to pure awareness approaches like the Dzogchen, for example, but I find those approaches to be somewhat passive as they try to guide the person to that non-dual space as opposed to inquiry. 
Can you comment on the differences between this direct path and the pure awareness a pure awareness paths? Is it just a preference, or are there pros and cons to each? Thanks. Well, I work with a lot of people who come to me, and so I've been doing vipassana, which is the one kind of zogchen. There's a kind of zogchen that's very much like what we're doing. And I was at the speaking of science on the water conference in Santa Barbara, California, a couple of years ago, years ago. And oh, Gary, was, Gary, we just lost that last part. If you just want to maybe lean in a little bit more. Okay, okay. Yeah, cool, cool. Uh, sorry. Um, I was speaking at Science Non Duality Conference in San Rafael, California, and there was a Zogchen guy there, and uh, he was giving his talk. And it could it could have been Ramana Maharshi, except this guy had a much nicer hat. Um, I mean, it was really exactly the same question. There are parts of Zogchen that are very much like right exactly what the self inquiry talking about. But as with Zen, there are two sides to this. There's the Rinzai side, which is the koan inquiry, uh, find out the answer side, which is what the side we're on. Uh, There's a, a 14th century Japanese Zen monk called Masui, who did exactly the same thing in Monsu. Exactly the same thing. Where am I? What is this? Who's in this? That's exactly the same words. Rin's eyes in. And there's the other side of the house, which is what you're talking about. The positive awareness, pure awareness. Uh, any one of those words you want to pick, the whole flock of them. Where you just sit there passively. It's called Soto Zen as well. You just sit there passively and just watch your consciousness in the belief that somehow you will see through this illusion. I haven't seen that to be very often that occurs. I've seen people who've got the 20 years of the positive, and they come to their Soto Zen, and I, they come to me and say, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years now. I've learned how to focus my attention. I've learned how to withdraw, pull back from the sensations themselves and be passively aware, but I'm no place. I'm really great at doing that, but I haven't gone anywhere. I'm still in the same place, still watching my breath, still watching sensations go by, maybe labeling, maybe talking to me, t- telling myself about them, what they are, but nothing's happening. I just keep doing it. So to me, it doesn't work. I mean, you don't go into this process of looking at the eye, which is the real cause of the problem, and go back and doing anything about it, trying to understand it itself. So I can sit there, this is what tends to happen, and an enormous ego develops because there's no question about the eye. You become a fantastic, incredibly awesome, pure awareness meditator with an ego that won't stop. And you're not doing anything to disabuse yourself of the belief that this ego is somehow really just one hell of a good meditator. If you start asking, where am I? You start to look at that question. You start to break this thing down and say, well, is the eye real or not? Then you have a chance of really solving the problem. And really getting out of this. The process is not a bad thing. It's not a bad place to start, but it's a place you're not going to finish from, in my experience. I, I find the same thing just, uh, you know, anecdotally working with people, teaching meditation, which I keep very secular, so I, I don't use a lot of these uh, uh, labels, but basically I find that there are two uh for two two things two processes that people need to learn how to practice the first is to just watch their thoughts and still their minds as gary is saying through vipassana type technique but then it never seems to occur to anybody unless you guide them towards it and teach them that it's possible to turn around and use that calmed awareness to look back and see who's meditating and so uh I've found people can have very rapid progress once they've learned to just be able to do the basic, uh, you know, count, counting the breaths to 10 uh, or doing, uh, you know, any of the other kind of so-called beginning meditative techniques, which you can, of course, do your entire life, as Gary is saying. But then taking that calming of the mind and using that calm space of mind and then say, OK, now I'm going to take that calmed mind and turn around and look and see who's meditating. Uh, I think if you look at the literature, which I have a little bit, you know, of of Dzogchen or Mahamudra or Zen, as Gary's saying, this kind of repeats itself, right? That people are fixate on the stilling of the mind. And then once they, once you still the mind, there is then the 
technique of looking back and seeing who is stilling the mind. If you don't take that next move, then you're always just in the stilling of the mind and sort of in expectation that this stillness is somehow going to dissolve the eye itself, which it cannot. Yeah, and you find with Boston people, as soon as they stop meditating, they're back how they were before. I mean, they really have to keep meditating to maintain anything like the stillness. The only chance you've got, in my experience, is to get active in the process. You're believing that if you sit there, somehow the brain will produce all of the illusions, all of your attachments, and you'll be able to investigate those and let go of them. It doesn't happen. The brain just sitting there. It's cool. We're just sitting here doing this meditation thing. We're just watching our breath. This is good. Staying ants. Over and over again, we've seen this now in research projects and studies. We've seen it with people, many people. They stop, they're back where they were before. Blah, blah has returned to the scene. Blah, blah has not left the scene. You go, when you're doing a task, like this watching mindfulness meditation, then you're occupied. You're in the task positive network. Things are being shut down. No blah, blah. I'm doing this job. I'm working here. I'm painting. I'm rock climbing. I'm windsurfing. I'm wingsuiting, you know, I'm doing this task. And while I'm doing this thing, I can't think of anything else, and so this is working really well for me. If I stop doing the task, whether well, it's any of those things, or just or this, that comes the eye. This is where self-inquiry comes in. So You can make it permanent if you do something about the subject that's the cause of the problem. If you don't, you'll never be constructive. Uh, Ivan is asking, um, so the awareness teachings are basically Vipassana. I thought Vipassana was just plain mindfulness. It's a question of how far you take it. There are levels of, of all the, the whole mindfulness thing. I don't know who you talk to, what school you're in. There can be seven levels, four levels, eight levels of achievement. There are different practices of mindfulness they can do. There's a whole enormous structure of different lineages laid out for this mindfulness practice. But they all refuse, they all don't look back at the subject. They just keep looking out at what's out in the consciousness, not at the subject itself. And that's a big problem. And just as a minor follow-up for Ivan, I would say don't worry too much about, you know, this path or that path being uh, attractive in that sense. You know, we're, we're, we're globalizing all of this uh, you know, at this moment, all, all these different traditions are sort of coming in contact with each other. I think the point is to be curious and to be practical about what works. It, you know, that, that no tradition owns what's going to work for you. You, you know, get it work from that basis in being able to achieve, achieve some calm mind and then turn back to the subject. Call it whatever you like, but ask whence that stillness comes and you'll start to get results. It doesn't matter, you know, what path you find it from, uh, you know, because a lot of times people want to say, oh, well, their path is the way or somebody else says that their path is the way because it was the path for them. It worked for them. But to me, if you stay curious, that curiosity that Gary was talking about a few minutes ago and you stay practical, then all that stuff will take care of itself because you won't be able to BS yourself out of the curiosity or the practicality. You want it to work. That's what matters. Yeah, part of the problem too, Ivan, is what in the end you hear me talking about stillness. I mean, what, but it is an uncaused stillness. If you look back at the subject and you do things we've been talking about, investigating the subject, and the subject then comes under enough scrutiny that it begins to go away, then you'll find that you end up with uncaused happiness, uncaused stillness. When you stop meditating, you're there left in stillness. Blah, blah does not return. It just does not appear back on the scene again. But you have to do the work on the eye to get to the place to where you are just nothing but uncaused stillness, no effort, no meditation, no procedures, no practice. You just sit there, and it's just quiet and still and peaceful. And people confuse those words with you, I can just sit here and watch my breath, and I'll, be, I'll get there. It doesn't work that way, in my experience. I've not seen anybody that's gotten there that way. 
All right, thank you for that answer. Uh, and Ivan says, thanks for the great answers. This makes things clearer. So thank you, Ivan, for your question. And uh, I'm going to keep going here. Um, I have a question from Mitchell. And it is, uh, after reaching non-duality slash no self in Buddhism, there are the emptiness and dependent origination teachings, which completely dissolve the observer. What do Rich and Gary think about these? Do they agree with them? I, I haven't seen them work. They're interesting teachings. I haven't seen them work. I mean, the whole, I, I just, I never bought Buddhist philosophy. I was completely purely empirical, just testing every subject, every process I could find and see if it worked for me. I paid no attention to philosophy, no theories of dependent, independent origination. I haven't seen anybody get any place in that except more sophisticated in the philosophical discourse. I just don't see that as a way through what to me is a fundamental empirical experiential process. I don't you can't reason yourself through. The, the Vita side of the house has piles of philosophy, just like the Buddhist side of the house does. Often compete with each other. I think Advaita is better. That's my preference. But I've never seen anybody philosophize their way to understanding, total understanding. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a beautiful cathedral of thought, basically, that Buddhism constructed as a set of interlocking symbols to point to this state, which a lot of Advaita Vedanta through Shankara, then emerges out of a response to. They're debating each other. And, you know, sometimes people had accused Shankara of being more Buddhist than the Buddhists. These are beautiful systems of thought. But as Gary is saying, that's exactly what they are. They're systems of thought. They, they, they can, their, their, their mere existence can point to the fact that some sort of state that they are indicating a roadmap for exists but that roadmap it it should not be confused with the territory that they it, as often happens uh, and i myself took many long side routes through buddhist philosophy through vedanta through the whole global philosophical traditions and it was a beautiful journey i'm not you know uh, saddened by it at all but where it led was towards the need to observe the subject. <laughs> that observing who I was, rather than looking out of the world for another system of thought that is even cooler and maybe gonna have another connection to this thing that I intuitively know is true and would allow my mental capacity to make maps out of it. And it all is really beautiful stuff, okay? But it's very easy to get sort of lost in it as this kind of tr tremendous labyrinth of thought instead of saying, hey, who's traversing this labyrinth of thought? You know, do I need to learn all these levels and all this vocabulary? And do I need to be certified and initiated by all these different Rinpoches and so forth? Or can I do it the way the Buddha did it, <laughs> which was himself? You know, the Buddha didn't have this elaborate uh, Buddhist philosophy to, uh, you know, um, articulate. So I, I do think it's a beautiful thing. It's just like, you know, there's a, there, there's a beautiful oriental rug here in Gary's room. That's beautiful. And you can observe the patterns in it. And you can observe the patterns in these different philosophical systems. They're like music. But if you get caught up in them, and think that some system in the world is going to get you there, then you're just going to be lost in that labyrinth of thought. Because this is fundamentally an experience. I mean, when the page turned for me, even though I had read lots of books, uh, it wasn't anything like what the thing was. It's like trying to describe to somebody what a rose smells like or what chocolate tastes like. I mean, you can go on, you can write mountains of books about what chocolate tastes like. But there's nothing like tasting chocolate. And so that's the difference. I mean, you can write about it. You can discuss it at great length about what chocolate tastes like. But until you actually taste a piece of chocolate, you don't have a clue what it is. So taste the chocolate. Uh, Mitchell has a reply here. I agree. But from what I understand, it's like another step. 
after dissolving the self, the self, there is still attachment to the here and now. And this is said to dissolve into pure awareness by getting rid of the observer completely. Yeah. Yeah, but you have to do it. But it, you can't just talk about it. I mean, you, yes, you can also, I mean, I, don't, I, I disagree with the first part of your statement, but I, I, I agree with the second part of it. But yes, get rid of your attachments. You will not dissolve the self until you get rid of the attachments. The self is the attachments. The self is the attachments. I mean, your eye is defined by the attachments. As you get rid of pieces of the attachments, you'll be able to see that there are different eyes with different attachments. You have to go through those, my experience, systematically going through attachment by attachment by attachment and letting go of them. As long as you let, as long as you have any kind of an attachment left, there will be a self there. There will be a sticking post tied to that attachment. As long as you have that attachment, you will have a self. Maybe a different self, smaller self, one kind of self. You will still have the self. You've got to let go. If you get rid of the self, it's almost nobody is willing to do, quite frankly. You've got to let go of all of your attachments. Almost nobody's willing to do that. That's that's the big difference. You just won't let go of all of your attachments. You can winnow down your suffering. Fewer attachments, less suffering. More attachments, more suffering. But if you want to get get out of the eye, rid of the eye, rid of the self, they all have to go. You can't say all of them except these two things, because then you still have a self that are stuck to those. So yes, you unwrap, unwrap all the attachments, you will be without a self, and you'll experience this transcendent state. But you got to get rid of your attachments. And one of them is sometimes, you know, and I, again, I'm, I'm speaking about you know my own experiences in the past, and that's all. Is like this allure of another level. You know, who wants another level? Um, whereas there's a quite short, you know, and concise statement in, of all places, you know, uh, the Gospels, which says, you know, only he who will lose his life will find it. <laughs> you know, you got to lose all of it. And even any illusion of seeing another level itself kind of like pulls the self along who would have an attachment to some other level. Whereas once, non once no self has been glimpsed or once non-duality has been glimpsed if practices are in place whereby it's continually you know visited and practiced and, and abided and inhabited then that dissolution will take place you know i mean it's an irreversible process as far as i can tell i i assume you know there are places where you can get stuck because there are attachments that will not be released but that's not because some other level has to occur it's because the practices are not being directed. The already existing practices are not being directed towards those attachments for whatever reason. Yeah, I just echo Rich's comment about attachment or levels. Yeah. As long as you believe there's another level, then you, you there'll be another level <laughs> because you are conceptualizing something else that you are going to achieve. I will get a magic star. I will get a cross around my neck. I will be wearing this giant gold medal. There are no levels. Somebody has to hold those levels. Somebody has to describe those levels. Somebody has to read about the levels. Somebody has to aspire to the levels. Find out who that person is. That person is attached to these levels and said either they want to be the person who has the biggest gold medal. And they'll be finished then. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you for that answer. Um, Back Mitchell, to the question. Yeah, Mitchell, thank you. If you have another re response there, some other thoughts that come up to uh, their answers, um, I'll definitely read it for you, uh, if you if you put it in the chat. I have a couple more questions here, and um, there's some really good ones, so I'm just going to keep going. Uh, Esteban has asked, uh, what kind of jobs, companies, institutions, and people are fun to have or be around when we enjoy playing this non-dual game. Of course, any job or any path could be the answer, but are there any other responses worth entertaining? Educational paths, other career paths, PhD programs? I think what, I think what you all should do is mm -hmm. take a PhD from Rich. He just got a teaching award from the university president presented. There's actually a paper over there talking about Rich's award. I think you should study with Rich. You should get a PhD from Rich, 
and he will guide you there. You just ruined my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think what's funny is in the question, who, who, who's the questioner again? Estefan? Estefan. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, the initial answer is like, it really is true. All of them, you know, I mean, and, and, and I'm not just being trite here that, uh, you know, when I met Gary, part of my biggest attachment was to my job because I was, uh, there were all kinds of fears associated. If I didn't have that job, was I going to be able to take care of my children, you know, and so on. And, um, you know, one of the big surrenders that I had to do was just, you know, surrender any attachment to any, to any particular job. And it's just like surrendering an attachment to any particular moment of just, being in that moment. And what you see is that whatever is right in front of you is a total and utter delight. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to transmit that. Now, obviously that doesn't mean that you want to, that probably you want to find yourself, you know, back in the 19th century working underground in a coal mine, you know? Um, although frankly, if you had to do this, these techniques would be helpful. Um, what becomes interesting is, is that the more that we surrender the sense that uh, we're really, you know, driving the bus here because there's no driver, the more we surrender, the more whatever it is we're supposed to be doing becomes more obvious to us. And we, in following that obviousness, there's a kind of delight associated with the fact that everything appears to be organized for us to be doing what we're doing right now. For example, there didn't appear to be any way in which I was going to be able to make it out here to Gary's house at 7.30 tonight on schedule as I was supposed to because of a number of household things that all came together and I was cooking dinner, picking my son up in t at tennis and so forth. But I didn't worry about it. I surrendered into it and everything became this kind of delight where like, and here I was rolling into Gary's driveway right at 7.30 uh, at night. So the answer is really everything. Now, that said, as you see with Gary and I doing this every month, this pleasure wants to be shared, right? So probably one way or another, you will find yourself in a situation where you're sharing it. If you're sharing it as a nurse or you're sharing it as a teacher, or you're sharing it as a handyman, or you're sharing it as a salesperson, or you're, you're sharing it in whatever way that you are, but you will find that you are sharing it, I think. Yeah, so I would also say that I had many, many different jobs. I had so many different jobs of all different sorts. When the page turned, I, I heard a story. I had a thousand people working for me for a research lab, a quarter million dollar budget. I want to talk to half a dozen people in a 35,000 person company. Uh, and it was that's how it happened. That's when it turned there. And I, after that, I did many, many other jobs, higher, lower levels, nothing, consulting, uh, offered to run a company, uh, coming back to the university, doing uh, stuff here, laying research organizations here. There's just it's not you aren't bounded by the job. I mean, my experience is the jobs come and pass. They come into your world and pass through you. And you, as Rich was saying. You remain as you are, fully present in the moment. And it doesn't matter what the job is that's passing by you at the time. Which what you find yourself in, it will come and go. Completely doesn't touch you. My one Zen teacher said, what happens to you is none of your business. <laughs> it just comes and goes. They can be multivaried. They can be non-existent. They can be high paying, low paying. But they just come and go. You be All you can do is be fully now, fully in the present, moment by moment by moment. There's no greater gift you can give than to just be here right now in this moment. With no agenda, no script, nothing that has to come out of this thing. It doesn't have to work out some way. You just are there fully present. As Rich was saying, no matter what you find yourself doing, you will find somehow this is being shared. Not necessarily allowed not proselytized, doesn't look like anything, doesn't have to be video, doesn't have to be any special format, just your very presence being here now 100% of the time, being no place else to right here, best thing you can possibly do.
and you will, you will make a big impact on people. Even if they never even know you, knew anything about this stuff, you'll make a difference. Your being will demonstrate that every moment has everything we need in it. And it's just so, it's so that every moment has everything you need in it. And by demonstrating that, that is, that is the delight of the work. It's beautiful. Thank you guys uh, for that answer. Um, and Esteban, if you have a, a reply, please jump in in the chat and I'd be happy to read it for you. But I'm going to go to Andrew's question. And he asks, is it possible to live successfully with no thought at all? For instance, if I begin learning a foreign language, could I learn it by reading the material but never giving what I read any conscious thought at all? No, the big uh, misperception is that you can't use your planning, problem-solving circuit with uh, thoughts. You can do that. That doesn't cause you a problem. It's the difference between how do I get to the interstate, and I have to get to the interstate in 25 minutes, or I'm going to lose my job, my kids will starve. Those are two different classes of thoughts. They feel different. They're energetically different. The brain is smart enough to recognize what those are, and it will be able to work with the first perfectly and not even touch the second. Well, you can almost surgically stop the second category. The ones that are problematic, you cause this emotional narrative, all this confusion and anger, and it's, oh, oh my God, this is horrible. Those thoughts can almost be surgically removed by this thing we're talking about. You will be even have higher functionality for your problem, planning, solving. Yes, I have to turn two rights and the left to get to the interstate. Whatever it is, that's unimpeded. Learning a foreign language, yes, go ahead and talk to yourself. It's better. It's, it's better, because you, you do it better. I just learned, I'm learning Sanskrit now for forever. Uh, and I learned some other languages. And you, you have to encode that somehow. And so yes, sure, go ahead. When you've got that ability, go ahead and use it. Just watch just watch those transitions over from time to time from moving into, I need to solve this problem, into, oh my God, I've got to get this problem solved. Now this is going to be a calamity. And just watch the difference in how those feel. The brain can sort those out. If you do this thing, and what we can work on is the second category, the highly emotionally charged problematic ones. That's what we're concerned about. There's a good video on this one, three types of thoughts or something like those words, but it really talks about how we do have different kinds of thoughts. There are different problems. They operate in different parts of the brain. They do different functions. But you're not lobotomizing yourself. You'll be function even better once you get rid of this blood flow. Yeah, I can even uh, speak from experience from what it was like when I first started studying some Sanskrit with Gary where there was self-referential thought there about like, I need to do this. I need to do this right. This is part of who I am. I need to succeed at this. I need to do this on purpose. And the, it, it, I was getting in the way as opposed to shut up and chant these words, <laughs> learn these words. When you learn the words, you become curious about, you know, the relationship of the words, to the characters, you become curious about the relationship of the words to the kinds of uh, teachings that they're embedding. And it becomes a much more organic process where you're not getting in the way of acquiring that language. So it's really the self-referential thought actually gets in the way of acquiring the language. A lot of times when we're doing introductory language stuff, like you're learning French or Spanish or German, I, you know, I remember, you know, feeling, you feel like an infant. It was like, what do you mean I have to learn how to say trash can again? You know, uh, and, you, and, and you get in the way of that. You become, an, you can feel the eye getting in there. Whereas if there's less of an eye, you're going to acquire that language much more quickly. And also, I, had, I, mean, I, I didn't know anything about Sanskrit when the page turned for me. I was resistant, strongly resistant to Sanskrit. I was never going to learn it. I told the one guy who was going to convince me to do that. I would never learn that. I was going to learn no text. I would learn chant nothing. I refused to do any of that stuff. And yet, all those things happened. This is after, you know, thoughts stopped. All of that learning came on board. Cognitive neuroscience didn't even exist when the page turned for me. 
since I've had a tremendous explosion of information as part of neuroscience. And you can learn that stuff. So there's no impediment to conducting an intellectual learning life, learning languages, learning other skills, not a problem. It's actually easier because you don't have this blah, blah you're competing with all the time. It's, oh, you should have done better. You didn't work hard enough yeah, yesterday. Exactly. You're falling behind. You were going to learn six words a day. You only learned four yesterday. That isn't there. You can get that out of the way. You can just do the learning process. The idea you have of yourself doesn't get in the way as much. Like, you can't understand this neuroscience. It just doesn't occur. Okay, well, that, that kind of answered, I think, the next question, which was from uh, David, who asked, is it possible to maintain presence and focus while working on a working process that requires thought? So it seems you're saying it depends on the type of thought you're putting to it. Well, well the fascinating thing is, is this a converse question? Yeah. I mean, the mm -hmm. converse question, is it possible for you to do something and not get lost in blah, blah? I mean, you, you think you're doing your job? I mean, I, I joke about when I showed up for meetings after the page turned for me and I had no, no narrative thought, I was like, how am I going to do my job? I have to have this internal narrative. And I found out I didn't need it at all. Not only that, but I was the only person in the room at the meetings. The rest of the people were sitting there. They were someplace else up in their head. They were totally not present for the meetings. They were off skiing or seeing some girlfriend, whatever, but they weren't in the meeting. And so you look like you're the smartest person in the room, even if you aren't, just because you're there. And nobody else is in the room except you all the time. They miss what's going on. They miss the flow of events. They miss body language. They miss facial language. They miss tone. You completely are not in the meeting. So the question back to you is, well, can you be present now with this blah, blah, and just see if it works for you? If you can be without that, and I'll tell you, it's a lot. You'll be a lot more effective without it than you are with it. For example, I just uh, did some edits on the book manuscript that Gary and I worked up together, and the process of doing that was so much easier than it used to be because I wasn't caught up in it in the same way. I was just observing it and doing it, and it occurred, and then I was done. There was no like, you know, oh my gosh, I got to get to this. It's got to be, you know. None of that. It just occurred. And in fact, it's really a, a wonderful process. Editing and writing in particular seem to be particularly associated with this state because you can really feel the difference between different phrasings that you're trying out in a way with no bias. You can just feel how one feels versus how another feels instead of thinking like, oh my gosh, I've got to get this paragraph finished, and like, then how's this paragraph going to finish, fit with that paragraph? As if I ever figured it out in advance in the first place. It just all kind of was doing itself anyway, and I was getting in the way periodically and trying to make it more complicated. And we also wonder about, well, can I get through my day without doing scenario planning in my head? You know, before I go to this meeting, when I see uh, Chris, I should say this to him. You know, last time I saw Chris. Yeah, I was supposed to remind you of Chris, that. Yeah. Chris was not very cool. And so I'm going to see Chris is next time. I'm going to tell him exactly what I think of him. Give him a piece of your mind. I will give him big pieces yeah, yeah, the, of my mind. I will, I, yeah, give him your PCC, I'll, your I'll, posterior cingulate cortex. And so what happens is I come to the next meeting with Chris with this stuff. I'm going to download on Chris. Now I'm really going to show him. Uh, I don't know if Chris is ready for this. I don't know if he's ready. <laughs> But I find out that I to see Chris, and he's he's a good guy. Today. He's a nice guy today. He's open and friendly. Where is Chris? And where did Chris go? And so you find with this whole scenario, the <laughs> plan is useless because you can't know Chris has changed. There is no time. Chris. A new Chris comes to the meeting. He's a whole different person than the one you had scenario planned for. And so all this garbage was for nothing. You just whipped yourself into a frenzy. You didn't use it anyway when it came time to see Chris. Yeah, but if you hadn't, you know, then <laughs> I will say, just as a proviso, that the sort of incessant planning and sort of basically shopping that most people are doing most of the time about what their future is going to consist of, I, I find it puzzling to deal with at times because it's so incessant, you know, like, what are you going to do then? And I was like, well, whatever occurs will happen. So 
But when I really have to, when I have to do real problem solving and scheduling, I can do it. But I, what I notice is, is that there's far, far, far less of it necessary than most people, in my experience, distract themselves with. They, a lot of people that I experience spend a lot of their time scheduling their entire life because they enjoy scheduling. And you, you can still make up schedules. You still have to say, we've got to have this meeting tonight at 8 o'clock. Sure. And so we, need, we know that has to take place. But you have no idea, as Rich was saying earlier, <laughs> about getting to the, my house at 730. Many, many things came up. He couldn't have foreseen those many things that, that, that arose. And yet somehow, he came here at 730. We've got this thing going at 8 o'clock as planned. So you don't have any idea what's going to happen in between. So just let go of those. Make your to-do list. Must get to a certain place, certain time. And then see if it happens. But don't try to imagine all the things that might happen to you in carrying out your to-do list. You will be unsuccessful. Otherwise, on the list has to be imagine how to move your hand to write the to-do okay. list. Right. And you can't. I guarantee you'll be wrong. Because <laughs> Chris is a much nicer guy. I thought it was <laughs> Would you would you guys say that you ever get bored? No, no, no. It's, it's fascinating because you think you would think you would think you would think that just this stillness, just this quietness. You're like, oh God, what are we going to do? Still, but, still. Oh no, we're still, still. <laughs> Four minutes have passed. And it's still, still. Hey, it's still. Oh, that? Geez, still. Hey, that's still. Hey, that stillness is still, still, still. But no, what happens is is Everything has a real vibrancy, a life to it it didn't have before. Because you aren't carrying around some image about how today, sh how now should be. Now is really a very potent, energetic, alive, psychedelic space. I mean, when they interview me, give me, put me in a, in a study, they find what I describe is psychedelic. Rich and I have talked about this endlessly. I'm a virgin on psychedelic. Rich is not a virgin. Uh, and so, well, almost anything. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> but but you know, you know, that whole idea is you're, all, you're in a psychedelic world, but with no exogenous chemicals. I mean, your perceptions are totally vibrant, alive, immediate, now, 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 now. There's no place else you would rather be that's more involved, engaging, uh, exciting than being right here, right now, 100%. What gets boring is you go off into your head and you lose this place, which is very hard to do also. I mean, it turns out the brain loves this space. It doesn't want to be crazy, conflicted, unhappy. Um, it just doesn't want to do that. It likes this space. And the more time it spends here, the more it says, this is way cool. We're going to stay here. I don't care about you. We're kicking you to the curb. We don't need you anymore. You're just a program. We're going to stay in this space. And it stays in that space, and it's a beautiful space to be in. Cosmos is anything but boring. Yeah, I, I, I mean, no, it's, it, it's impossible even to imagine having been bored in the past, you know, 10 years. No, never bored. <laughs> awesome. Even in a meeting. Even in a meeting. Because no. you're there. People are fascinating. You can watch what's going, <laughs> what's going on in the meeting. People don't think it's going on in the meeting. You can actually watch when he says something, the CEO checks his. Yeah. Oh, phone. it's fascinating. This guy over here is turning his head, looking away. So he took a check out to go to his lab. I mean, you can just see what's going on in the meeting, what's really going on in the meeting, aside from the da 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 da. So you can watch what's really happening in the meeting. Which is never subject to your prediction. You know, that something something novel is always occurring that you never could have predicted, wouldn't you say? Absolutely, absolutely. The very nature of now, you can't predict it. And so it is endlessly fascinating. Even standing in the line at Trader Joe's, there's fascinating things happening, standing in the line at Trader Joe's. Just amazing to watch what's going on, people's faces, their actions, how they're queuing up, what they're buying, what they're not buying, their reaction to the clerk. I mean, it's just amazing how much vitality there is in right now, just being present for it and not being up in here someplace. You say, where am I? You're not up here. You're really here. 
Right, when you turn this down, the entire world starts speaking to you, basically. You know, in these signals, you just everything is alive with 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 the drama, and you get to observe it, and it's funny and beautiful. This is going to be just another question for me, but yeah. a very like practical one. Like, if sure. you're in in that line at Trader yeah. Joe's, are you still yeah. thinking you're? Are you still able to be present if you take out your phone and check your email? Is that is that still could who's that still be? And that's well, who's doing it? Yeah. <laughs> No, really, yes. You just, everything occurs as if it were going to occur, you know. There, there's there's no problem with that. Um, there's just nobody doing it and trying to get through the line and wishing the line would be over or, you know, any of the other stuff. There's just that moment unfolding. Isn't that? Yeah, if you yeah. walk in the door, you pick up the little basket. You say, well, you just think about it, you pick up the basket. And you walk around and you walk over to where the oranges are, the bananas are. You decide not to buy bananas, you buy oranges. Oh, those oranges smell you just good. You move around mm. and you just do mm. your thing. No <laughs> thought. You just go around and just find, find the, air, the everything crackers and, you know, put them in your little box. Oh, they're all out. If you can't find them, you walk over. To you. <laughs> but it just all happens as it happens. There's no storyline about it. There's no meditation about it. You just find yourself going around, you walk in the line, you get out, you go out and get in your car. You know, think, I've got to walk to my car now. I must turn to the right to get to my car. I must put the key in out of my pocket. I must push the button to open the door. It's just all it's all a dance. It's all happened all that way anyway, your entire life. You just thought you needed this narrative up here talking about it. In fact, the narrative is completely out of sync with what's going on in your life. You don't need to tell you to pick up the oranges. You can walk over. And pick up the oranges without talking to yourself about it. And then because you're present, maybe somebody's in line with you. Speaking occurs. Somebody talks to you. They notice you're not preoccupied. Somehow they tune into the fact that you're not preoccupied with yourself. Or the cashier. You notice the cashier. The cashier notices you. There's actual relationship happening as opposed to like, all right, you know, I, you know, they were more expensive last week, but I guess, you know, <laughs> you know, none of that chatter ever was doing us any good. So you've just removed the malware, but you're still going through the line. Everything is still happening. It's a beautiful dance. Well, thank you. Yeah, that, that, I love that, the malware. That's a great way of putting it, um, removing the malware. Um, Michael uh, put in a comment here, comment, a question for my, mm. that, that's about this. For many months, the experience has been thought clipping. Inquiry is hardly ever needed. Thoughts start and uh, stop almost immediately. It feels like a movie that goes in and out of focus. It isn't frustrating. Life is so much better this way than the constant blah, blah, blah. But I'm sensing some stagnation. Thoughts? Well, so as far as the, the, the zapping thing, I mean, we talked before about, you know, the brain can recognize good thoughts and bad thoughts. And if you've been doing inquiry or you've been doing surrender techniques like Sedona or Byron Katie, I mean, the brain develops a heuristic that very quickly goes like one of those mosquitoes after it's, it just, it's gone. You don't even hardly see that it arises and it's already been zapped. So, and that's point one. Point two is, yes, was you first transition out of the old way into the new way, the brain's trying to get things sorted out, organized, get this new network all set up and everything. The brain's doing a lot of stuff, even though we can't be conscious of it, thankfully. Offline, it's busy doing things, trying to get this all sorted out. The more examples you can give it of stillness or you know, good data points, the more success it will have at reorganizing the this, this structure. But while it's reorganizing, it's going to seem unsettling. And you may be, you may feel confused. The brain's not confused. The brain's doing what it's doing. You may feel like it's not happening at the right speed. It should be happening faster. It should feel better. The book says it should be feeling like this. It's feeling like that. What's wrong with me? What am I doing wrong? In the gym? It's right. all but a sham. It, but just let, just, just trust that the fact the brain's going through a lot of work here. This is a complicated job. Thank goodness it takes its time. It's going about this very planful, like riding a bike. It's learning how to do this thing. So give it some slack and just trust that it knows what it's doing. It wants to do this. Just give it enough data and it will do it. 
this point of trust is really uh, vital to uh, you, I, I'm recalling now, you know, moments where it seemed it's almost, you know, so volatile because of that zapping things would come up and go down. And um, I didn't have a framework for understanding what I was going through, but I trusted because I saw that Gary had gone through this and I would say, Oh, you know, was it bumpy like this? He'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, it was bumpy like that. Uh, that, you know, acquiring the trust in the process and acquiring the, 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 the experience that is totally irreversible and then it's going, you know, and you're being carried along with it. So no worries. Um, can then allow you to use self inquiry on that experience of stagnation, right? Because there can be a kind of thrill to that. Some of those initial transitions, where you're like, woohoo, you know, I'm on the other side of this. But, you know, where's the big progress now um, that, you know, it's not so much a sign of stagnation as it's just a sign of a place to use self-inquiry. Like, you know, well, who's worried about making progress? You know, there's really no progress to be made. There's just stillness to be given to the brain. The brain will do that. And as Gary is saying, it's doing a lot of it offline. So it seems confusing, but um, there's no going back. So just ask who's worried about the stagnation be with the one who would be worried about the stagnation, engage in these surrender techniques and it'll get smoother and smoother and smoother and smoother. Then it'll be a bump. <laughs> then it'll be smoother and smoother and smoother. And sometimes the bumps can be scary when it's been smooth because you thought you were done with all of that. But after a while, even those become beautiful opportunities for like, Oh wow, there's a, some kind of a, you know, occlusion there what is that um so i think it just continues to unfold like that and it will for you so it sounds beautiful it may be helpful too to remember that the brain is basically going through a real estate redevelopment project i mean it's got big buildings there that it's wondering about if they're still useful and so we'll pop them up and say you care about this building anymore and you say no i don't care about it and the brain tears it down and has to haul it away and then build another building. And whilst doing this process, it's, it's going to seem to you as if something strange feels like it's happening down there. But the brain is basically doing, or keep that in mind, a real estate redevelopment project. And that's what it really is. It's very careful about the real estate it has to work with. It's trying to do the best job it can with every square foot of acreage it has. And so it will bring things up that it's going to ask you basically, do you still care about this or not? If you don't care about it, then it brings us, okay, we're cool with that, we're going to take it down. And it does. And it'll just keep doing that and doing that. Don't forget, there's probably a trillion synaptic interconnections that you're going to be, the brain's going to have to work on to get this thing figured out perfectly. So it's going to take a while. You'll see little bumps along the way as it finds new buildings and pulls them up and says, you care about this building? You say no, and it tears it down and hauls it away. So it's going through that process continuously as it refines and makes this tighter, smoother, sweeter network. That's why it takes a while for it to get smoother and sweet. If brains have to learn how to do this thing, clear out the real estate, get all the old buildings down, and build new ones. Yeah, and a lot of the buildings, you didn't even know the buildings were still there. You know, so, you know, what? That's still there? I can't believe it. But it's a beautiful process, and it does just get sweeter and sweeter. Thank you for that. Thank you for the the light uh, up ahead on the process there for, for the rest of us. I appreciate that. Um, I think we have time maybe for one more question if you guys are okay with that. Uh, if you yeah. have time for one more. Okay, great. Um, Omar asks, do you guys find that the more intimate one gets with the silence and stillness, the more impersonal things become? Depends on what you mean by impersonal. Um, Maybe you can chime in there, Omar, if you're if you're able. But yeah. I'll what, see if he's what, able to chime. What are you impersonal with, Omar? I mean, say impersonal, impersonal with the word stillness. It doesn't have any meaning because as you go away, the stillness is there, and there's less and less person there to feel anything about. If you're feeling, oh, I'm impersonal now towards my girlfriend or my kids or my wife or whatever, my partner or my boss. Um, I'm personal to them, different than I was before. Yes, you're less attached than you were before. 
And so as you are less attached to them before, you will not feel the same way towards them personally. It doesn't mean you won't attend to them, be present 100% for them and whatever they needed. But you, you will not be as attached personally. And so it will feel different for you. That's what you mean. It is, that does happen. But you're there in your uniqueness for them when they're there. It's true. There's no attachment, but there's also no filter. It's like it's it, it feels like the process of just becoming what you are. And and so it uh, only reason I hesitated on the impersonal is because it almost sounds like it's cold or distant or something like that. And, and to me, it's the opposite, uh, that there is a kind of mutual entanglement of everyone. And so the and particularly the less attachment you have to, you know, particular beings in your life the more any being can be uh, worthy of, of love. You, you find yourself loving everyone, frankly. There's just no one there really doing that love in the sense of there being someone there to be attached to that loved one. As much, this is something I didn't understand when Gary first told me was that, you know, that, that there can't be any, that there's no particular love you have for loved ones because you're loving everyone who's before you. It's yeah, so a Trader Joe metaphor. Yeah. You, you can feel towards the cashier at Trader Joe's very much like you feel towards your partner, your kids. Not exactly, but very, very close in the same way. So you are accessible and available for everybody. Because everybody is just her, just the universe dancing. There's no speciality. Just because evolutionary Darwin do we may prefer this person because we get more genes passed to that person. That's a small factor. But as far as the general sense of others, the others are all the same. And really everything else is the same. And that extends to the trees, that extends to yeah. the chipmunks, you know, like you, you you see the vibrancy that is underneath everything. And so in that sense, yes, it's impersonal because it's all one thing. But you're a part of that all one thing. So you get to experience that. You get to be aware of being part of that one thing. I hope that answers your question. Omar clarified, uh, yes, I guess outside of the loop of repulsion slash attachment. So I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> well <Good>. said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Omar. And I think that brings us, well, it does bring us to the end of our time here. Uh, Gary and Rich, if you have some closing words, it's been a, another amazing and helpful session here. Just that this is beyond possible. It's right here, you know. I mean, every now and then I go, huh, whoa, how did this happen? Um, and that, you know, engaging in, you know, that, that curious, practical work on your subjectivity on your on the subject doing the same kind of work you would do if you were you know i don't know making a coffee table or something and being careful about that designing it and uh and and creating that in the best possible way and sanding it down you take that same level of precision same left desire for completion and 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 uh success and you turn it around and you do this self-inquiry technique and you do it in accompaniment with meditation and a good physical practice and a good diet and sleep. Incredible. I mean, I, if anybody could have ever told me that it was this simple, not to say easy, I, of course, would not have believed them. But, uh, you know, I, I think we're here to say that it really is that simple, meaning just as it's relatively simple to make a coffee table, if you have the right tools and the materials, you are the materials for your own biohacking of yourself. And you can do that. You can upgrade your operating system, as Gary is saying, and it's not beyond your ken. You can do it, and nobody else can do it for you. Yeah, I'll just final append and say it's all about perseverance. I mean, this is not rocket science. This is a very simple... They call it the direct path, direct path. Uh, the tasks are very easy to see. They're very clearly laid out. You just need to be persistent, and you have to have enough desire to go through it. I mean, most people, almost the ones that don't make it, 
are the ones who don't have enough desire to go through the process. They get overwhelmed by fears. They get overwhelmed by things they're afraid to let, let go of. But if you just persevere and you have a desire to go through this thing, you'll be successful. This is not rocket science. It's not hard. Rich says, I think many, many people could do this. It's just do it. Just do it. And I, and I think we're here to also say those fears are not real. Those things that you think are so vital to you to remain attached to, not actual. You can let go of those things, and the other side of it is just sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. The more you let go of those things, the better it is. I, you know, I, I, I've gone slowly through this path. I'm a slowpoke. So I, I can still remember you know, all the volatility, and I, I can testify to the fact that it just gets sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. There's light at the end of the tunnel. How many years, Rich, would you, or how long have this, would you say it's been? I would say, you know, since 97, but maybe, uh, you know, in a more accelerated way since 2002. And then I met Gary three, four years ago, and it, uh, I was ripened to a point before meeting Gary, and then, you know, it really accelerated. Beautiful. Well, we're so happy you guys met and, and that, that you're here with us tonight. And it's been an amazing session as always. I want to thank everybody who's been on live with us and of course um, everybody who's asked a question. That's what that's what this is all about. So there actually were a couple of questions that were I've been asked to email to you guys, which I will do. And I also put the link in the chat here if you guys uh, who are here live with us and, and if you're on the recording, if you can contribute what you could to this effort, it would be much appreciated. We're so grateful to everyone who's been giving regularly. It helps us pay the bills so that we can continue doing these shows. So that link is in the chat. It will also be emailed to you. We really appreciate any little bit helps. And with that, we'll be letting you know uh, via email as well um, when the next session will be next month. We're looking forward to it. Thank you again, Rich and Gary, so much for everything. And thank you, Chris. Uh, Chris, the... Uh, good guy. <laughs> the good guy, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so thank you again. Um,